We're going to have a great time this morning around God's Word. I welcome every one of you uh, here because it's always good to be with Jesus, isn't it? Amen. And He's welcome here this morning. He's welcome here to do whatever He wants to do. Can you say amen to that? Come Lord Jesus. He's here in the power of His Spirit to help us this morning. And as you know, I'm a teacher of God's Word, so I'm going to be teaching this morning and, uh, and helping you. Maybe you've always wondered about uh, the Jews being God's chosen people, but He has a chosen people today as well. And by the end of this message, you're going to understand that. So Lord Jesus, we pray that as we open Your Word, You will help us, not only with our understanding, but that you would speak into our hearts and realise the wonderful blessings that you've given unto us. Now, Lord, bless this time together, we pray in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the title I suppose I put to this message this morning is Discover the New Way of Living, Being in Covenant with God. <clears throat> it's surprising the number of people who live their lives to try to win favour with God by attending church, uh, being kind to other people, paying their tithes and, uh, and doing things like that. And these things do need to be done, but it won't bring the required or desired result. In the Old Testament, the Jews, they lived by the law. And the law was very important. It was made up of ceremonial laws, moral laws, ceremonial laws. Uh, all of those point to the New Testament. In particular, they point to Jesus. There were the moral laws and God has not done away with his moral laws because God has never changed his morals. And of course, uh, then there's just we, what we call the stories, like the story of Daniel and so forth. We think, well, what, what is there in that? Well, many of these men were men of great faith and they leave us an example of how they lived through hard times or certain events that happened in their life. So nothing in the Old Testament is, uh, is really out of date. It's still applicable to us today. But the Old Testament contains many things that are what we call types and shadows or pointers for us. Now, I know I say this all the time, but if the sun is shining and I cast a shadow, that shadow is not me, okay? If you want to find me, you follow the shadow and you'll find me, all right? And if you follow the shadows, types and shadows of the Old Testament, you will understand God's great revelation to us. But the main pointer of the Old Testament is that salvation is only found in Jesus, who is the, the way, the truth and the way. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> now, Today I'm going to talk about something in the Old Testament. We're going to come into the New Testament. Pastor Downs has made uh, passing reference to this in past weeks. And uh, so today I'm going to see if I can put a bit more meat on it and a bit more understanding. I trust that you'll be able to fully comprehend what I'm teaching. You'll need your Bible and, uh, and you'll get a great blessing. When Abraham was 90 years old, the Lord said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And be perfect. And then I want to go to Genesis chapter 17, where we are going to pick the story up. In verse 7, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7. If you've got a Bible, open it up. It says, 
and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed. Everybody say seed. Thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. This is my covenant. This is verse 10 now. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man, child among you shall be circumcised. Now you say, what a subject to be talking about. But stick with me. <laughs> In verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And what Pastor Downs is often referred to just in passing, and I've been away several weeks, so he may have elaborated on it a bit more, and that is that circumcision brought Israel into a covenant relationship with God. It was important, as we'll see in just a minute. Circumcision brought Israel into a covenant relationship with God. It brought them many, many blessings. It brought them God's presence. And we understand, I'm going to refer, and Pastor Downs has referred to this, what David said when he was facing Goliath. He said, and David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? That's the giant. And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should deny, defy the armies of the living God? So what, what did David mean by that? Sometimes these things can go right over our head. Well, Pastor Downs told us, to those who heard David, he was saying, this giant is not in covenant with the living God because he's uncircumcised. So God is on our side. We are in covenant with the Almighty, so he will give us victory. So you can see here that David is pointing to the importance of circumcision. For the sake of not being misunderstood this morning, allow me to add a rider before I go any further. Today, I am not advocating physical circumcision because we are now under the new covenant where circumcision is now of the heart. And um, Paul said in Galatians 6 verse 15, for in Christ there is no circumcision. Let me start again. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. We are a new creature. Back to Abraham. When Abraham, Abraham had two sons. His second son was Isaac. First one, Ishmael. And he circumcised them both. The Bible particularly mentions this because he obeyed the command of God. All right, now, just exactly how important was circumcision back in those days? So we're going to go now to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, and we're going to see the significance of it. God has appeared to Moses in the wilderness, in the burning bush. God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to go into Egypt and set my people free. We know that Moses tried to make a lot of, mistake, a lot of uh, excuses. He made a lot of mistakes in not trusting God here. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 11 it says, And the Lord said unto me, that's unto Moses, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swear unto their fathers to give it unto them. So Moses was instructed 
to exhort the children of Israel to fear the Lord, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord their God with all of their heart and with all of their soul. I'm pausing so something will sink in there. Even back then, they were told to love the Lord with all of their heart and with all of their soul and with all of their might. Verse 15. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. In verse 16, he's saying he was also to remind them of their need to be circumcised and not to be proud. This verse is telling us that in addition to circumcision, which was a physical ritual, God also needed to change their hearts. So in the Old Testament, it wasn't just only living by a set of rules to please God. It was more than that. You, you find this little, uh, it's not a suggestion, you, you, you find this repeated fact that God says you have to have a changed heart. And we cannot please God today just by living by rituals, by keeping the Ten Commandments, by, by being good to people, by going to church and uh, all those sort of things that the world think, well, I'm pleasing God, so therefore I'm going to heaven. It's much, much more than that, much, much more than that. It's much more than just believing in Jesus because many people believe in Jesus, but the Bible tells us that they probably won't inherit the kingdom of God. We must be obedient unto him. So back to Moses. Now he's journeying to Egypt with his mission to deliver the Israelites by the power of God. And on the way, something very strange happens. He's with his family, with his wife and with his children. This fits in with the overall picture of the Abrahamic covenant. The basis for the Exodus, all right, I'm skipping here because I don't take up too much time today. The basis for God's taking the children of Israel out of Egypt fulfilled the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. Under the covenant, Israel would be rescued out of Egypt and led into the promised land. So as I said, Moses was making a lot of excuses, but he got over that and he was on the way now to Egypt. Moses had been married to a Midianite woman and the Midianites did not practice circumcision. Moses had circumcised his first son, but it appears that his wife was not too happy about that. She refers to it as a, excuse the expression, this is like swear word in Australia, but he, she referred it to it as, as a bloody situation. She was not happy with it. Their second son was not circumcised. And here they are on their way to Egypt. Because of this failure to circumcise the second son, if God was going to save Israel on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, how could he use someone who was clearly being disobedient to the covenant? How could he use a man who had been disobedient to God's covenant? And as a result of this, they're on the way and Moses is stricken with a debilitating sickness almost to the point of death. We're not sure whether it was he or his wife recognised what had caused this situation, but we are told that his wife took a flintstone and performed the circumcision on the second son. That's how important circumcision was. It wasn't something that could be overlooked as something as messy and 
and, uh, and agonising. Moses had to circumcise both of his sons and be obedient to God if God was going to use him in deliverance. So as we've learned, circumcision was a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God. It served as a reminder of man's need to be close with God. And we know that when there's a circumcision, there's blood that was shed. This is a shadow. The other reason for the sign being made in that particular part of the male body is because that is how the sin nature is passed on to successive generations by his seed. It's important. Also, not only is the sinful nature passed on, but it also shows how God passed on the covenant with his promises to those of the seed of Abraham from generation to generation. So whilst there may have been the passing on of the sinful nature, there was also the passing on of the covenant which made them God's people. This word, the seed of Abraham, it just crops up time and a time and time again. And if you're like me, you just read right over it. But it really means something. Under the new covenant, there is no benefit of circumcision or uncircumcision. So I don't want you to think that I'm suggesting that every male child needs to be circumcised today. The new covenant, on the other hand, offers a new and better circumcision, and that's what we're going to learn about now, which we all need if the underlying problem of sin is to be addressed in our lives. You see, what that covenant of circumcision did is it brought them into covenant with God, but it didn't deal with the sin problem. So they were God's people but still, the sin problem had not been dealt with. And of course, they were sinners. And Paul said, if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made as if it's uncircumcision. We know that all have sinned. Every one of us have sinned. My grandchildren last night were... Uh, at outstayed at our house, the two youngest ones on Ruth's side, and as usual, they granddad has to tell the story before they go to go to go to bed. So, most of the time, I try to tell uh, uh, Bible stories. So we were telling a Bible story, and uh, I was talking about Adam and Eve and how they sinned in the garden, and I said to one of them, I said. Have you sinned? Yes, Granddad. I said to the other one, what about you? Have you sinned? Yes, Granddad. So even little children know that they have made mistakes and sin. But we should be telling our grandchildren and our children how God saves us, can save us from our sin, and we can be in covenant with him. So we will see how New Covenant, sorry, New Testament circumcision not only brings us into a covenant relationship with God, but New, New Testament circumcision deals with the sin problem. You're quiet. You see, now it's a step further because what the circumcision of the Old Testament could not do, the circumcision of the New Testament deals with it. In the Old Testament, even though they were in covenant with God, they still had to sacrifice animals to appease for their sin. This didn't really deal with their sin because it was as if their sin was put on an account book. If I could just put it in simple terms, all their sins were recorded and laid down until such time that Jesus came and died upon the cross and dealt with their sins in that which were from the past. Now, 
He, we, look, we look back, they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. We look back to what he has done and thank him for dying for our sins. So it was like being kept on account. Under the new covenant, Jesus dealt with our sins through his death on the cross and his resurrection. And everybody said, praise the Lord. I say, praise the Lord. Yeah, as your sins dealt with? So we need to be thankful about that, that God has dealt with our sins. Circumcision is now the circumcision of the heart. It's not something external. It's something that happens in our heart. As circumcision in the Old Testament signified being in covenant with God, so circumcision under the new covenant signifies being in covenant with God. We have to make sure that we do the right things to be in covenant with God. Amazingly, this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Let me just quote from Ezekiel. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. God is saying, this prophecy is saying that God was not going to just deal outwardly. He was going to deal inwardly in the future with his people. However... The full power of this circumcision was not possible until the day of Pentecost. It was not possible because on the day of Pentecost, everything changed. That was the beginning of the New Testament church. <clears throat> so when his law is written on our hearts, we begin to love what God loves and hate what he hates. As our sin nature is cut away in circumcision, that circumcision of the heart, when it's cut away from our hearts in new covenant salvation, we enter into a peaceful relationship with God. I, dist I had been a Christian for many, many years and had never had a true revelation of what God can do. But when I acted upon the word of God and was baptised in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, I remember thinking to myself, I can't believe it. Now I really believe my sins are forgiven. Something had happened within me. No, I used to doubt, well, are my sins really, really forgiven? But after that, I was convinced. A new, a, a Christian writer wrote this, and I'm going to read it. No longer is God's law saying turn right when our whole being desires to go left. But we receive and begin to grow in the unspeakable blessings of a new nature that inherently desires to turn right when God says turn right. God literally changes us from the inside out by the circumcision of the heart. You, when you are born again, you have an open heart surgery. The great surgeon of heaven operates on our heart and turns our heart from the waves of sin and turns us back to Him. Hallelujah. Because God wants us to be in covenant with Him. The amazing thing about it, and this may answer a lot of your questions, even when we fail God, even when we fail him. And if I asked you to put up your hand if you fail God, every one of us would put up our hand. Even when we fail God, in the depths of our heart, there is a speaking, a talking, an urging to repent, ask God for forgiveness and turn back to him. Have you experienced that? Yeah, it's conviction. So isn't it 
We could say easily, it's a terrible thing when I'm convicted. No, conviction is something wonderful. That's God speaking into our hearts and, and it, it, into the circumcised heart and the heart speaking, turn back to God, you know what you should be doing. So the Spirit of God speaks from within. So I suppose some of you have already picked up on it, but we must ask how this circumcision takes place. Is there scripture and verse for how this, script, how this circumcision takes place? So I want you to turn to this now in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. As pastor says, give me verse and scripture. Give me the verse. Well, here we are. It's not the only verse, but it's pretty straightforward here. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 2, and verse 10, speaking to the church who has been born again. They've already been born again, though, because that's the epistle. Paul is writing to the church, not the unsaved. He's writing to the church at Colossae. In verse 10, he says, And you are complete in him, talking about Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power. Now, here it is, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the, res by the circumcision of Christ. Okay? So it's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ performs a circumcision. There's no full stop following the word Christ here. Even though the verse changes, there's no full stop. It just goes ahead. Let me read it now. In the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So what is this saying? Because there's no full stop there. It's all part of the, of the same sentence. The putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ means baptism. And it says it, buried with him in baptism. So what is the circumcision of the heart? It's when you get baptised. Don't just think you get wet. There's more than that to it. When you are baptised, a terrible lot happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot happens that maybe you don't even realise. And that's why after that, we rise with him. We have resurrection power because our salvation will rise us to go and be with Jesus ever, everlasting. Under the old covenant, those males that were not circumcised were rejected from Israel but they were also rejected as God's covenant people. So New Testament circumcision brings us into covenant with God, with his promises, with his protection, hallelujah, with his blessings. Being baptised in Jesus' name is not just a process of joining a church. Oh, no. It's a process that God requires us if we want to inherit eternal life. I'll say it again. Literally, this verse is clearly saying that New Testament circumcision begins with water baptism. That's when Nicodemus asked Jesus. He said, how can a person be born again when he is old? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, except the man is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The fruit of a person's change of mind when they repent of their sins, the fruit of their repentance is to be obedient and submit themselves to water baptism. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? 
Have I left you behind? Are you with me? Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You know, I really enjoy it when kids join in. I don't know if you went in the first service, but a little girl, just a little girl, she just appeared out of nowhere, wandered down the hallway there and came over and tapped me. And I said, what is it you want? She said, I want you to pray for me, Bishop. <laughs> yeah, terribly beautiful, wasn't it? I said, you want me to pray for you? Yes. So I prayed for her. I didn't know what she wanted prayer about, but I prayed God would bless her and lead her into life. And when I finished, she said, thank you, and then walked back. <laughs> she wouldn't have been even seven years old. <laughs> Amen. I don't even know that. I've never seen the little girl in church before. That sometimes it's amazing what, what, how kids can teach us, isn't it? Just like circumcision was a mark in the flesh that brought the Israelites into covenant with God, water baptism in Jesus' name does the work on the inner man and marks us as part of God's people. Now remember I said the Old Testament covenant of circumcision brought them into covenant with God, but it didn't deal with the sin question. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15, talking about Jesus, it says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In other words, the whole family of God is named by the name of Jesus. Yep. So how do we get that name? On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when they had realised that they had crucified the Messiah, they cried out, what must we do? And Peter replied, repent, turn around, turn from your sin and be baptised, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here we see that baptism is in Jesus' name. Why in Jesus' name? Because he's the one who died. He's the one who paid the price. Amen? If you want me to pay you some money by way of check or something, or even your bank account, you've got to give me your name and your bank account number so I can give it to you. Then you'll say, well, John Downs gave me this money. He paid this money. Jesus has paid the price of our sin upon the cross. It says here, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. We don't hear that word remission very often today. When I was a boy, very often you'd, when you got a bill in the mail, it would say, please remit. Please remit. In other words, please pay the bill. And so when we are baptised in Jesus' name, for the remission of sins, we are claiming the fact that Jesus paid the bill. We're being baptised and said, it's upon his authority because he promised he would pay the bill. You can't pay the bill for your sin. And so not only then do we become part of Jesus' family, but we are the children of God, the sons of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So let me just reiterate here. The Old Testament covenant of Abraham was circumcision. And if the, if the male child, or child was not circumcised, they could not be part of Israel and they could not be under God's covenant. But we know that the Bible speaks, even in the Old Testament, about something that would happen in the New Testament that would change our hearts. And we read about that called the circumcision of the heart. And as I've revealed to you through in the book of Colossians, that happens at baptism. So what are the results of receiving 
a circumcision of the heart. What, what happens when you are baptised in Jesus' name? Number one, our heart is free to love God. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul and with all thine with all thy might. Number two, first one, our heart is free to worship God. Second one, we can worship in spirit and in truth. Scripture and verse, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision, this is written to the church by Paul, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we've not got any more confidence in a fleshly mark. Number three, the indifference to the things of God is just the indifference to the things of God is destroyed and we respond with a desire to be obedient. I've, I've mentioned about this, about what happens to those who are born again. Those who are not born again, they, get, they sin, they just keep on sinning, they don't even have a conscience really very much about it. But when you've been born again, the circumcised heart talks to you and says, come on, find your way back to God. You need to repent of that sin. You need to ask God to forgive you. Number four, God can now write on the fleshy tables of our heart. It's no longer necessary for God to thunder out of heaven like he did on the mount and carved or chiselled his commandments into stone. Now, he's written them upon our hearts, the fleshy tables of our hearts. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 says, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not with tables of stone, as it was in, with Moses up on the mount, but in the fleshy tables of your heart. Number five. We now become receptive to the Holy Spirit. When a person is baptised, the Bible says, repent and be baptised in Jesus' name for remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the proper order. Repent, be baptised and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is so much easier for somebody to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost when they've yielded to God in baptism and stood up in public and confessed that they've repented of their sin and Jesus is their saviour. Amen. Amen. I can't go beyond saying this, and that is there's a deep, deep change in our heart. Maybe you've never been baptised in Jesus' name. Maybe you've never experienced this real deep change in your heart. Maybe you don't have that 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 spirit that speaks within you from your heart saying you need to turn from sin and, and turn to the living God, well, then you need to be baptised in Jesus' name. Amen. Covenant loyalty to God and God's people is, the only, is only possible when we are baptised in Jesus' name and the heart is recreated inside. So when you are baptised, God... The great surgeon does something very, very special in your heart. So I've mentioned that on the day of Pentecost, they all came running where they heard these strange tongues, people speaking in tongues. They crowded around and Peter stood up and he ministered to them the fact that they had crucified Jesus. They didn't realise <clears throat> that they had crucified the promised Messiah. 
And a lot of people today who are unsaved don't really realise that they are rejecting the living God. They believe in God, but when they don't turn to him, they've actually rejected him. So Peter was preaching under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it pricked their hearts. It really hit them hard. And they said, Peter, what are we going to do? How We've crucified the Messiah. What are we going to do now? <clears throat> Verse 37 in Acts chapter 2 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? What must we do? A bit emotional. <laughs> when I first came to this church with my wife and family, we only had that little part of the church right back there. It was in the first couple of weeks, and I preached the word of God, and something very unusual happened. Maybe Sister Sarandos, Brother Sarandos may remember. A woman ran out of the congregation running towards the pulpit, which was down the other end, screaming, tell me what I've got to do! Tell me what I've got to do! Remember that, Brother Sarandos? Yeah. It was amazing. That night she was baptised in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. And that night, demons were cast out of her life. She was bound with demons. A wonderful deliverance and filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Tell me what I've got to do. And that's exactly what they were doing here. Tell me what I've got to do. And Peter answered and said unto them, Repent! Turn around, turn from your sin and be baptised, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Many translations say for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if you've been baptised in Jesus' name, the promise is for you. Acts chapter 2 verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptised. And the same day there were added unto the church about 3,000 souls. So what do we take away here from this message today? Number one, just by keeping laws cannot free you from sin. Number two, the Old Testament law of God was not an end in itself. It pointed people to a better way and we're living in the age of that better way. Number three, the mark of circumcision under the Old Covenant has become circumcision of the heart under the New Covenant. A new heart is what God always wanted to put within his people. Circumcision of the heart is through baptism which brings us into covenant with God. If you have not been, I'll be blunt, if you're not baptised in Jesus' name, you are not in covenant with God. You may, you may know about God. You may even know about his Bible, the word of God. You may know many things. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter Preach the New Testament gospel to repent and be baptised in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. Number four, the uncircumcised heart remains numb to sin. The circumcised heart is always alerted to sin and the need to repent and live in victory. Number five, in circumcision under the old covenant carried wonderful blessings. Under the new covenant, the circumcision of, heart, of the heart 
carries even greater blessings. Say amen. And number six, now if we're under the covenant of God, the New Testament covenant of God, we have an advocate. It talks about this in the epistle of John, that we have an advocate. You know what an advocate is? It's a solicitor, a barrister who stands up in court for you. When Satan accuses us of being lost because of our sin, we have a barrister, we have a solicitor who will stand up in the court of God and say, they are innocent because I died for their sin. And hence, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I used to read that verse many, many times and read right over. You know, we can read over words that have deep meaning. Let me read it to you again. That if we confess our sins, if, in other words, if we pray to God and say, Lord, I have sinned. It says now that he is faithful and just. What's the word faithful mean? It means because he promised, he will do it. That's faithfulness. He promised and he will do it. So if we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive us of our sin. But it says he is faithful and just. Just? Yes. We can't be punished for a sin when Jesus already died for our sins. Amen? Even the law of today says you can't be punished for the same thing twice. And Jesus has been punished for us upon the cross. So justice is also involved and he cleanses us from all sin. I'm going to finish off now but refer back to what David said about Goliath. But I'm going to put it in our words. This is for you, saint of God. Satan, who are you to defy God's children, bringing us into bondage and fear? We declare that Jesus has reconciled us to himself and welcomed us into the family of God through baptism in his name. Amen. Please stand. Well, I think most of you know I'm a pretty, uh, bit, been a bit confronta confrontational today. Maybe talked about things a bit delicate, but we need to do it if we're going to understand the Bible. But if you want to enter into covenant with God and you're not being baptised in Jesus' name, we were going to have a baptism after this service today. Unfortunately, the brother is not well. He's got an infectious disease. Uh, namely flu and uh, so he decided to stay at home so there's, we're not having a baptismal service but I believe he's going to be baptised next week and if you want to join him in the waters of baptism all that you've got to do is ask and we'll, we will sit down with you and talk over the word of God bring you into a grade of understanding not only what God can do for you in baptism but what he can do for you in living a Christian life. I know there are hearts here today that are not settled. They're troubled because they've never been able to find a place in God that brings peace. When Jesus promised peace. They feel that they're outside the blessings of God. When God said He wants to bless us, You need to obey the words of Peter, the apostle, who said, repent, turn from your sin. Maybe you want to come and, and repent of your sin here this morning. Yeah, this is a good old gospel service where you come and kneel down and ask God to forgive you. And then you can ask for baptism in Jesus' name, for the forgiveness of your sins. At that point, your heart will be circumcised. And then you can receive the precious gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus walked down the streets of Jerusalem bearing a cross, the cross that we should have been placed on. He bore the cross and He bore our sin upon the cross publicly. Although He was God, He humbled Himself and died upon that cross for you and me. If you want to be baptised, you can also come and stand here as a public declaration to say, when that baptismal tank is open next Sunday, I want to be baptised. Now, I know this is not easy. I've been down this road. When I was in church, and it wasn't even a Pentecostal church, when I first gave my heart to Jesus, I knew I had to go out to the front. But when I went to take that first step, my feet felt like they were full of lead. I found it so hard to move. But when I got out in that highway and went down the front, I knew everybody was looking. And when I got down there and looked around, I was the only one there. And I was thinking to myself, now they know I'm a sinner because I come here and ask God to forgive me of my sins. But if you want to know eternal life, that's, you've got to take that big step. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there comes a point in our life when we must first step out and confess that we are sinners and ask God to save us. We're just going to sing now. I haven't chosen the song. Our musicians will lead us. Please, don't be afraid. There's an altar here to repent. There's a place to come and declare that you want to be in covenant with God to take the first steps. And also, if you've been baptised and want the Holy Spirit, you can come down here and we'll pray for you to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is all Bible. Amen. Thank you.